total security blackout, the 1st Canadian Corps moves from Italy to the Western Theatre of Operations. Now the story of the Great Migration can be told. All formation signs and identification marks are removed from men and vehicles for security reasons. Leaving the 8th Army, they reach the port of embarkation in Leghorn, Italy. Here the tedious business of loading transport for the whole Corps progresses rapidly. It's old stuff to the veterans of the 1st and 5th Divs. They have loaded their equipment on shipboard so many times, they can do it in their sleep. An unnamed Corps pushes off for the coast of France. It carries with it memories of many glorious deeds and heartbreaking tasks in the Mediterranean. It leaves behind over 5,000 comrades on the fields of Sicily, Sardinia, and Italy. It took part in capturing nearly 70,000 square miles of enemy territory against desperate resistance. Now it's on the second lap of the journey to join comrades in arms of the 1st Canadian Army. The Incognito Corps arrives at the French port of Marseilles. Here they unload for the last part of the trip. 5th Div alone have to transport over 4,000 tanks and vehicles, 50,000 tons of supplies and 18,000 men. The great task moves steadily ahead without a hitch. By train and convoy, the vehicles and tanks which weathered the Hitler line in northern Italy start on their long trip across France. Around cooking fires, the lads look forward to the day they will swap tails with their pals in second, third and fourth divs. Finally, the moment of reunion arrives. Their old friend, Field Marshal Montgomery, drives out to meet them. Their old CO of the 8th Army and their new commander of 21st Army Group greets them as one veteran warrior to his pals. The whole great movement is completed in an unbelievably short time. Four days for the trip through Italy, 24 hours on the water, and five days on the road to Holland. Now the 1st Canadian Corps joins the 2nd to add their force to the final blow. At a German castle behind the lines, Canadian prisoners of war await the trip home to Blighty. Many of them were captured at Dieppe in 1942. They really know the monotony of life in a Jerry concentration camp. They also know the joy of being released by their countrymen, Canadian paratroops and United States spearheads. After living like animals in a crowded camp, freedom is like a draft of rare wine. At the United Kingdom airport, the ex-prisoners arrive by plane. They are welcomed by the station OC, his airmen and airwomen. It's a grand feeling to walk on English soil again after so long an absence. Blighty sure looks good. <laughs> are made to feel right at home by the station staff. During their brief stay before moving to the Army reception depot, they enjoy open house. Late periodicals are eagerly scanned for the latest news over a traditional cup of tea. Talking to real live English-speaking girls is a big thrill after months of isolation. After documentation is completed, it's a way for some well-earned leave. Canada's only war correspondent to be captured by the Germans, Bill Kinmond, describes a prisoner's life for the Canadian Army newsreel. What was the life like in the, in the camp? Oh, it's, uh, it's a pretty grim affair. The Germans don't do any more for us than they have to. Uh, life could have been happier if they'd have got Red Cross supplies to us, but they refused to lay down transportation for them, and the result is we just starved to death the last few months. Most of the food were what the Germans call terms, but they're uh, sweet and mangled sort of things we feed to the cattle at home. 
far back as I can remember now, we went to bed every night hungry and for most of our waking moments dreaming and thinking and talking about food. But uh, I guess like all bad things, it came to an end and a week ago today, the Yanks drove up to camp, three Jeeps, and we were liberated. At a Canadian airport, the first anniversary of the RCAF Overseas Mail Squadron is celebrated with business as usual. In the first year of operations, the Flyers have carried 120 million letters to Canadians of all services in overseas theaters of war. Those welcome notes from loved ones in the Dominion are loaded by the thousands ready for transfer across the sea. The Overseas Mail Squadron supplements the work of other air groups who have been bringing the mail since the early days of war. They fly all the mail from the UK to Canadians in the field. In Slip Trench and Tank Harbor, Johnny Canuck gets the news from home quickly thanks to the mail squadron of the RCAF. At Canada's naval establishment in Esquimalt, the new 75-foot swimming pool is put to good use. Designed for the training of Navy personnel in life-saving, it has other, more interesting uses. Off-duty wrens turn on the spray before launching the body beautiful in the pond. The brand new pool is a great attraction for Navy personnel of both sexes, relaxing after the strain of operational duty. Leading Wren photographer Hazel Smith makes a pretty picture, not only with a camera. Underwater swimming is good for developing strong lungs. If anybody wants to develop strong lungs, Hazel will give you three easy lessons. Strange as it may seem, the sailor lassies can really swim. Maybe we should have joined the Navy and been posted to HMCS Naden in sunny BC. Continuing the drive into Germany, armor of the 4th Canadian Div overruns a strong point at Prisoita. The armored brigade reduces it to ruins as they hunt down snipers and repel frequent counterattacks. Heavy machine gun nests and mortar detachments are rounded up and the advance continues. Forward recce units probing enemy lines take over another Jerry airfield at Kloppenburg. The runways are bomb cratered from our air attacks. Numerous thousand-pound incendiary bombs still lie intact. They will be returned to the enemy with interest, the hard way. Another prong of the Canadian attack strikes toward the North Sea. Men of an Ontario Infantry Battalion and a Western Tank Unit attack the Dutch town of Groningen. While the attack is still in progress, civilians try to save their homes while under sniper fire. For them, the lines of prisoners are a happy sight. It means liberation and a return to the normal way of life. The third arm of advance is aimed at the Zyder Z. At Diren, tanks of the 1st Canadian Armoured Brigade link up with the brigade of the 1st Canadian Div. Veterans of Italy are welcomed by hysterical Hollanders. Driving ahead, our armour outflanks the town of Appledur. Hollanders don't need the inducement offered to round up stray prisoners. The outmaneuvered army scatters like chaff in a wind. Rolling along in high gear, armor of the 5th Canadian Division goes all out in the race for the coast. Hutton is overrun and the infantry left to clean up.
Finally, the objective is reached. At Harderwijk, 5th Div consolidates its positions on the shores of the sea. So ends, victoriously, the magnificent drive through mud and flood to the Zyder Zee. <laughs>